So, the latest Frontier Unlocked just happened, which means we have some fresh announcements to go over and speculate about. Two, to be exact, the new Explorer, the Mandalay, and the new system being overhauled in the game, Powerplay 2. Now, of course, if any of my speculation or extrapolation of information seems like it doesn't make much sense to you, if you are a more experienced commander, you can always consult the Frontier Unlocked stream itself down in the description. So let's get started with the Mandalay, the new explorer ship coming to Elite Dangerous, and it's coming with the next update, Ascendancy, releasing on October 22nd. You know, assuming there's not going to be any delays or anything, which is possible, but I guess we'll find out. Anyway, they gave us the full breakdown of the internals. We're talking optional internal hard points, jump range, you know, S SEO capability, fuel economy, that kind of thing. So let's get started with those optional internals. We're going to have one size six, one size five, two size fours, two size threes, one size two, and three size ones. Obviously that size six is gonna be used for a fuel scoop, and that size five is going to be used for a class five FSD booster. Which means if you're gonna run shields on this thing, which, you know, if you're doing exobio, you'd probably want to, it's gonna be a size four, which is to say, this thing is gonna be made out of absolute paper. But it is in design competing with the Jumpaconda or the Exploraconda, whichever you call it. If you were to take a Anaconda, strip it of basically everything and pump up its FSD capability, you would get a 90, 80 to 90 light year jump range. This ship is going to beat it. I'd be curious to see if it beats it with utility. We're talking SRVs, shields, you know, anything that costs weight and heat. I'd be curious to see how it performs in jump range you know, with that on board. Now, you wouldn't think this thing is made of paper just by looking at the hard points because it has six of them, four of which are mediums. The other two are smalls, but four medium hard points is surprising. They were joking about the fact somebody is going to 1v1 this thing uh, with a Hydra, which is absolutely going to happen. And somebody is going to win. It's probably gonna be in the first day of this thing's release. But the core internals are all size five, except for the life support, which is size four. It does not support fighter bays. You can put SRV bays in it. And of course it is tuned for SEO. Although it will be the slowest of all of the ships in SEO, but the smoothest. Now, obviously SEO is so fast. Being the slowest SEO is still tons and tons and tons faster than flying manual. It will also be the most fuel efficient, which means if it does beat the type eight in SEO performance, as in like distance, this thing might be able to go a million light seconds, maybe. Because the Type 8, which is a Schrader, can get like 600,000 light seconds or something like that off of a single SCL, like a full fuel tank, admittedly. But, you know, considering the Class 5 fuel scoop you're going to have on board, you can definitely manage that. This thing is going to be crazy because if it gets 90 to even 100 light years in a jump, I'm going to start exploring again. It's been a long time since I've actually done any exploring. Man, I've been waiting for something that has utility that can go, you know, 80, 90, maybe, maybe, speculatively, 100 uh, uh, light years in a jump, which would be absolutely insane. Not sure about the utility mounts or anything like that, but overall looking like a pretty cool ship. Now do keep in mind that when it does release on October 22nd, it is coming out in early access, which means you can buy it for, I don't know, anywhere, I think it's around 10 to 15 USD, somewhere around there, 16 USD or something like that. If you don't wanna do that, you can just wait a couple months and it'll come out free. So there you go, as long as you have Odyssey, of course. Now, I know a lot of you came here for the news about the new Explorer, but I'm gonna be honest, out of the two things coming in the Ascendancy update, I am more excited for Power Play 2 than I am for the Explorer. In fact, I don't even know how much I'm going to be experimenting with the Explorer on the first few days of the update because Power Play 2 is looking like it's going to be very interesting. A couple weeks ago, they did a forum thread where they asked everybody what their questions about Power Play would be, and then they would answer some on this Unlocked. And we have 15 questions to go through. So let's just jump right in. Number one, will players be able to influence Power Play 2 in more gameplay ways? To which they said something like, the majority of activities will be part of Power Play. Specifically, they noted things like trade and salvage. Now, obviously, I've talked about this a few times in a previous video where I mentioned I think that the best thing for Power Play 2 to be is basically just BGS with a UI. And them saying the majority of activities in the game affect Power Play 
is a very good sign towards that in my opinion. But either way, question two, will on foot activities play a larger role in Power Play 2, which is a uh, yes. Odyssey missions will be a part of Power Play 2 now. They noted uh, specific things like uploading malware to an enemy settlement. Really good. I'm glad that's the case. Odyssey is a part of the BGS, so I'd imagine it would fit pretty well into Power Play. Number three, will it be open only? No, not on launch, but they are monitoring feedback on this. So if, you know, it's a complete disaster, I'm sure they'll look into it and change it. Number four is a question asking them to outline the transition between Power Play and Power Play 2. So players will be unpledged when Power Play 2 launches, and internally, they'll be taking a snapshot of the galaxy to make sure that each of the powers retains about 99% of its current systems when we switch over to Power Play 2, just to make sure it's not, you know, super jarring or anything like that. Number five, will players be able to support multiple powers? And this is probably pretty obvious, but no. You can leave a power at any time, but when you do, you will lose your loyalty ranking. Number six, will there be any changes to the crime and punishment system? This one was particularly interesting. They mentioned there is a few things they're going to add to the system. I don't know if by a few things they mean just this one thing, but I guess we'll find out. So power-specific security will now be present around nav beacons and star ports in a powers given territory in addition to the typical system security they care more about power alignment which means uh, they may attack you if you're quote in the wrong place which may add a very interesting dynamic to this as far as i'm aware this used to be the case in the original power play but doesn't really seem to happen anymore i i have no idea i, I haven't really played power play so you know we'll see sounds interesting number seven will current power play gains be wiped on power play 2's release and they basically said yes without uh, saying the word yes you obviously wouldn't lose any modules you got previously but you're gonna need to redo your loyalty rank with them number eight will there be new powers the answer is yes there will be one new power present when power play 2 launches it will be nakato kane i think is the name which will be an alliance power and placed uh, somewhere in edmund's unoccupied systems that of course raises the questions of do we get a new power play module because of this and also don't worry i will be getting into how you get to those modules as well later on number nine will it be possible to completely knock out a power and they said that there isn't an automatic system in place that just removes them from the game, but they will make the decisions on how they will be removed. I assume they'd want to have some leeway there for like Galnet articles and maybe a CG, so we'll see come the day that a power loses basically all of its presence. Number 10, will the ethos system linked to governments be changed? Now, I don't personally know much about this, so I'd love somebody in the comments to explain how this works to me because I don't really understand the answer. They will be removing the link between governments and powers, so you won't need to have a government that doesn't match your power in order to maintain control, like Ace Link the Fall, they mentioned specifically. I assume this means, uh, you know, if you go into Imperial territory, you'll notice that almost all of them, if not all of them, are patronages, and that may no longer need to be the case in order to influence the system. But again, I'd love somebody to clarify that in the comments, somebody that's actually, you know, played Power Play. Number 11, how will the BGS impact Power Play 2? Now this question and the next one are very confusing to me, so let's get into it. So they answered it kind of like this. It isn't directly tied to Power Play, but because of the fact that many actions that are used to affect the BGS now also affect Power Play, there's going to be overlap there. Not a direct link, but still connected. And then number 12 asks, will players be able to impact Power Play 2 without pledging to a faction? To which the answer was something like, you will have to pledge in order to have an impact on Power Play. That doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> okay, so let's say that you are a random commander that isn't pledged to anybody and you go into an Imperial system and then find a little independent anarchy faction and then blow up their influence to effectively knock out the Imperial presence in the system how is power play not going to react to that you know i feel like power play kind of has to react to that because you would have gotten rid of their presence in the station or you would own the station instead of them a power play i assume would react to that and that doesn't really matter who you're pledged with the influence changed the bgs changed so maybe power play 2 runs differently than i thought again anybody that's played power play or maybe knows what this is supposed to mean would love your input. Number 13. Will Power Play 2 have more visible effects 
on the galaxy. Now, they went over this in a previous Frontier Locked that I made a video on, so if you would like to know more, the answer is basically yes. You can check out this video right here. Click on the I card in the top right or whatever, yada, yada, yada. Number 14, will player effort be uncapped in Power Play 2? And their answer was basically yes, and there will be no diminishing returns, which is again, it kind of doesn't make a ton of sense to me because the BGS, unless they're changing that too, has diminishing returns. That's how they balance it for casual players. So if influence in a star system has diminishing returns, which basically means any negative influence you can impose on anybody else has diminishing returns, then how does that not affect power play? Again, I don't know if I'm just over my head here. <laughs> don't understand. Let me know, man. <laughs> this is so confusing. And finally, number 15, how will Power Play 2 make the conflict between widely backed powers and lightly backed powers more engaging? To which they said something like, there will be mechanics in place that will benefit the small powers more. Large powers will probably be spread more thin due to them owning more star systems, and there's something there that will give them, quote, a fighting chance. So whatever that means, I guess we'll find out. Uh, maybe influence or something is worth more if you're smaller, We'll see. That basically just requires testing. Now, about those power play modules, I have an extra note here that I actually heard watching other streamers and content creators that are partnered with Elite Dangerous, such as Brother Sabathius and Obsidian Ant. All power play modules are now available from all the powers. The difference between them is the order in which you are given the modules when you progress through the loyalty ranks. This is actually an incredible change that I am so glad they did. I was worried about the power play modules because at the end of the day, that's probably what most people are going to interact with power play for. Although I would, if the system is any good at the end of the day, encourage trying it for what it is. This is great. This is a really good change. And overall, I'm really excited to see what power play two brings to the table for elite dangerous. Like I said, I've talked about this before. I think that the biggest underutilized mechanic in elite dangerous is the background simulation. It is casual friendly. You can do it as a solo. There is so much gameplay there that's, you know, tying together all of these otherwise seemingly pretty disconnected gameplay loops. I dare say that if Power Play 2 comes out and it is casual friendly enough and offers enough progression, raw progression, that would effectively be how many people would play Elite Dangerous. Power Play 2 could be Elite Dangerous for a lot of people because it could be that thread that ties all of this stuff together. One of the hardest things about getting into Elite is going, what should I do next? What can I do next? How would I even get about doing it? And having a thread that ties all of the different gameplay loops together and you know, you get what I mean. It would be really big for Elite, I think. So at the end of the day, that's all speculation we have yet to see. October 22nd is the release of Power Play 2 with the introduction of the Mandalay into early access. And a couple months after that, it will be released for free. If you're excited for the update, have any speculations, have any thoughts, let me know down in the comments. All right, that's all I got. I'll see you around.